You said that the problem with those angry women is that since at the end of the argument you cannot fight physically, you can't really deal with them. <laughs> that's not what I said. I said that that's one of the things that keeps conversation between men civil. Women can't argue with angry women. Women are often bullied by angry women. What I meant was more, uh, you, uh, you, you, you said that, and I'm really like not trying to paraphrase you or you know, to put words into your mouth. Uh, you, you, you actually you are trying that no, directly. No, it is things that you said, that you cannot deal with uh, those Yes, uh, but don't tell me that you're not trying to put they're words hysterical into my mouth because and all you've this. selected well, what you're going to ask, and you selected it very carefully with a tremendous amount of forethought. Well, I, no, and I, there's a purpose for that. What is the purpose precisely? I am, I am quoting things that you said. Why? Because, what is it that because, you're trying because, to establish? Because you said that. I'm I thought we were talking about masculinity. We are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. What? How are we talking about masculinity? Because I'm asking you what you think of men and of women. Isn't no, that... basically what you've been trying to do, I would say, for the last 15 minutes is put me into a sequence of corners by accusing me of various forms of misbehavior. So why are we doing that? What's the point here? This interview, clearly JP was not in the mood to have some little pretty boy Frenchman put him in a series of corners. So he's just calling him out straight up. And during his first 12 Rules for Life tour, when he was doing all of this media before he got sick, this is basically rinse and repeat what the journalists were doing. They would basically get him in a room, find a bunch of things that could be construed as controversial that he'd said and try and hammer him home on the semantics. But on this day, he clearly wasn't having it. And I do love this because so often you see this with people who have these controversial opinions. I mean, it baffles the mind as to why Jordan Peterson is still so massively controversial. But this is what they do. They'll just take his arguments and then they'll try and misconstrue them and straw man his arguments just to try and get their little moment where they make him look bad. And there are so many more interesting things that you could be talking to him about. And this is why you don't really see Peterson do these interviews anymore. He understands that if he goes into these hostile environments, rather than reaching some sort of peace and discussing these ideas in a productive way, they're just going to set traps for him and try and make him look bad. So what he does now is he goes on alternative platforms, people who are more independent, people who are more free thinking and who actually want to have a genuine conversation. And unfortunately, we can't see him absolutely obliterating mainstream journalists anymore, but there are trade-offs in life. And speaking of obliterating things, guys, most of you who are watching my content are ninja watching it, not subscribing, not liking. So make sure if you enjoy this content that you you hit that subscribe button. You've talked a lot in defense of traditional hierarchies, both of gender, of class, so on, uh, though emphatically not of race. Uh, and so it seems that- I haven't talked about defense of traditional hierarchies in terms of gender and class. That's not true. Well, you've talked about hierarchies in society. You've talked yeah, about- Yeah, that's yes. true. I have well, done that, you not define but that I haven't class? justified them on the basis of gender and class. You, you, whatever it well, okay, you, you talk Not about, okay. That's an important yes, distinction. Okay, so the next few clips, I want to highlight the way that Jordan Peterson doesn't let the argument get too far off track. You'll notice here that instead of letting people ask their whole question and straw man him in a bunch of different ways and misrepresent him and his arguments and what he said, every time they make a semantic mistake, he corrects them. And this way he draws the box. He is in charge of the parameters of the conversation and he doesn't let people step outside of the box. This is the truth. This is what we're talking about. This is what I've said. And I'm not going to let you stray away from that. I'm not going to let you misrepresent me. If he doesn't do this, what ends up happening is that they misrepresent him in 20 different ways. And by the time he actually gets to talk, he's then got to untangle all of these things that this person has just said. So if you're ever being questioned about the things that you've said and the things that you've done, this is a fantastic thing to do. Be extremely observant of the things that they're saying and not just the broad concepts, but all of the little details, all of the words, all of the semantics, and then make sure your intentions and what you've said are being represented properly. You defend hierarchies in society in a way that you talk a lot about the Pareto distribution, yes? That doesn't mean I yes. defend it. Well, okay. You, no, you, not well, yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you talk Observing a lot- Observing that something exists is yes. not the same as defending it. How in the world- Well, people attack it, right? What's that? You don't. People attack it. Attack it's inherently what? Attack the hierarchies of society is inherently unjust, right? Well, they are, they're unjust, yes. but they're also useful. Okay, so you, you, def you say they're useful. Some well, look, people would look, disagree look at with it that proposition. Way. Okay, look at it this way. You obviously think that it's worthwhile to stand up and ask a question. Yes. So you think that standing up and asking a question is better than yes. not standing up and asking a question. Yes. Okay, that's a hierarchy. Yes. Of values. Yes. Okay, without the hierarchy of values, you couldn't act. This next clip is a brilliant example of Peterson subtly controlling the direction of the conversation. The guy that Peterson's debating here doesn't know what he's doing, but every time he says a sentence, Peterson will add a small detail or two. Humility doesn't preclude activism. 
Uh, generally, it does. Yes, Why? but, uh, but that doesn't to... mean that doesn't mean that I'm saying that there is no situations under which political action or activism is justified, because there are clearly situations under which it's justified. But it's not the first thing that you should be taught how to do when you're an 18-year-old person going to university and right. you don't know a damn thing. So I don't doubt that there's callow youth. I don't doubt that people have a lot to learn, and that, yeah, and they're and not that, learning it from their professors either. That may be true. That may be true. But you're clearly, I mean, a big part of your narrative comes from that energy of resisting that kind of, you know... Circumventing it. Circumventing, but you're also yeah. saying, you know, these people who complain about the world, they should just focus on their own, their own, what they can control themselves and work within that space. To begin with. To begin with, but, but mm. equally, there is a slight derision in the tone about people who actually care about bigger than self it's issues. It's not slight. Okay, it's big then. Humility actually does preclude activism and 18 year olds who have just entered university shouldn't go about trying to change the world and they're not learning anything from their professors and I have a massive derision for them. That would be a lot to take in at once, but instead Jordan Peterson slowly drip feeds it. He listens very carefully to what the interviewer is saying and he puts in little points every now and then. Every time a moment pops up and every time the interviewer tries to slightly go off track, Jordan Peterson will pull him back in line, boom, back on Peterson's path, goes off track, boom, pulls him back in line, goes off track, pulls him back in line. And basically without the interviewer knowing it, Jordan Peterson completely controls the direction of the conversation. So bigger than self problems, which are They don't care about them. They just act like they just, they're just they? acting out Who? the delusion that they care but about which, them generally. You, you seem to be... I watch in, activists, the activists at the universities. Right. I know what they're like. And we've seen the videos and we know that kind of confrontation. Yes. And I don't we've seen doubt, Wilfred Laurier, for example. I've seen many, but I don't mm. doubt that there are those who, who are like that. But there are many millions more, and I mentioned Gandhi, but yeah. you know, arguably... You can't use him as an example. Okay, well, Buddha, for example. Or Buddha, him. Buddha, left his <laughs> Buddha left his wife and child. Yeah, but you can't use them as examples. Okay, First of then, all, like, Buddha's like Christ. It's like, well, there's Christ. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? No, there's Christ no, in university activists? No, no, but there's... Like, no. Well, there, there's... Um, so Martin Luther King, can I use him? Yeah. Right? So Martin Luther King had an affair. It was quite yeah. well known. You know, his personal life was a bit complex. Yeah. But you wouldn't say that, you know, he had to sort that out before he went to sort of try and deal with civil rights in the U.S. So I'm just, I'm, get, I'm trying to get at the, the core of the tension. No, I would say that his own personal faults didn't preclude his social responsibility. Right. And it really is important to get that straight. But right. I would say that his own personal faults uh, served as a detriment to his overall mission. Right, right. And then I'm, I'm not, believe me, believe me, I'm not saying that if I was in Martin Luther King's position, I would have done a better job. It's like, I am not saying yeah, that, man, yeah. not in the least. Notice the difference in strength of communication techniques. Every time Jordan Peterson corrects this guy and interjects with a point, this guy basically just folds. He's trying to use Gandhi as an example. Jordan Peterson says, nope, can't use him. Tries to use Buddha as an example. Nope, can't use him. And instead of continuing with his point, the guy just folds and tries to look for another angle. <laughs> All right, this last clip is one of my favorite Jordan Peterson moments of all time. And the amount of cojones that it takes to do what he does here is impressive. I mean, he's on the Bill Maher show with a bunch of people who all hate Donald Trump. In the middle of the Trump presidency, when the Trump hatred happening from CNN and the Bill Maher show and these other outlets is sky high. And the studio audience are obviously on the left. They're all Bill Maher supporters. And just watch closely because you can actually see Jordan Peterson's words physically bouncing off the head of the other panelists. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the first time Donald Trump said something that was actually true, if he said he'd leave us alone on our marijuana decriminalization? It was a warning shot to Michael Cohen, the president, that if they tried to claim that my client was a liar after 60 minutes, there was going to be consequences, and it worked. And it worked perfectly because we heard nothing from them. So we have the DVD, and we're going to release it when and if it's necessary, and we're going to see what happens with the case. <laughs> But, 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 make, but make no mistake about it, it's locked and loaded. <laughs> Does this smug, bald man look familiar to you? That's Michael Avenatti, and he was the lawyer for Stormy Daniels, the porn star that Trump was laying down the pipe for, allegedly. And he looks freaking sure of himself here, doesn't he? He's on Bill Maher, primetime television, he's got a nice shiny bald head, and he is happy with himself. Let's check in with how Michael Avenatti's going these days. Disgraced attorney Michael Avenatti was sentenced to 14 years in prison today in Santa Ana for stealing millions of dollars from his clients. He, of course, gained fame after representing adult film actress Stormy Daniels in her case against former President Trump. The court ordered Avenatti to pay more than $7 million to his four victims and $3.2 million to the government. The 51-year-old is already serving five years for extortion and fraud in New York. Locked and loaded. <laughs> can, can, can I ask a, <laughs> can Trump I ask is an like, why can't I question get this? about this? Yes, I mean, please. I've been listening to yeah. all of this about Trump and watching how this conversations go in the US and I have one question about it. I mean, 
there's all these people in the US who are on the conservative side who are aligned with Trump for all sorts of reasons. And there's all this tension around his presidency and attempts to pull him out of his office for various reasons. And I, what, what do you think will happen if that comes to pass? What, what do you think will happen to these people that have identified with Trump? And, and like, how is it that, that, that Democratic types, for example, are holding out their hand to say to these conservative types, sort of like, welcome back into the fold? Because it looks to me, from an, out, from an outsider's perspective, that your country is polarizing in a way that's not good, and that you know people are going after Trump. And I understand that. It's not like I don't understand that. But there's all these people that elected him and that are identified with him, and they're they're not taking this well, you know. And so, well, they're not. They're not. It's not. And you know, you might not think they're very bright and all of that, and and you know, they're backwards and 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 all of those things, but. But, you, but you, you know, listen to the studio audience here. They're laughing. They're all just like anticipating that he's going to make an orange man bad joke soon. Because orange man bad, right? They're like, hold on a second. People don't come on here and empathize with Trump supporters. Who is this alien? <laughs> you, but, you, you know, you need to have respect for the rest of your citizens. And if, you're, if your country isn't going to pull itself apart. And I really see this happening from an outsider's perspective when I come down here. And I lived in the States well, for a while and it wasn't like no, this before. It, now that takes balls. To go to an environment where people are hostile to you and to ask a question that you know is going to go down like a lead balloon, but a question that is so relevant and that absolutely needs to be asked. Like half of the country is completely disenfranchised by this. Half of the country loves this man and he's being constantly slandered as are they by the liberal media and the liberal elites who look down on them and turn their nose up at them. And guess what? Jordan Peterson was completely right. Look at the chaos that ensued over the next few years. They should have listened. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you liked that video and you're a Jordan Peterson fan, then you will love the breakdown I did of Jordan Peterson's appearance on Q&A Australia. It's one of his classic performances. So click here to watch that one. And if you get value from this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'm Jake, and this has been Rattlesnake TV.